Okay, let's discuss some abdominal pain today. Let's dive right into this. Introduction. The location and characteristics of abdominal pain may indicate a possible origin. Well, I just read that slide to you, but that's what that slide is about. So let's get into the rest of this. What will contribute to that decision is these factors like age, tolerance, pre-existing conditions, perception, and mental state. We've all seen these different calls. Children don't localize pain well. The tolerance level of elderly and obese are different than others, sometimes better. Pre-existing conditions like diabetes, alcohol, other meds. Neuropathy of the nerves in those diabetic patients will change how they feel pain. A person's perception of the pain will be different. We all feel pain and relate how pain affects us differently. Hysteria, emotional distress, doesn't need that. Important to note that throughout history, from the beginning of time, really, that abdominal pain has plagued the human race. And in fact, has been the terminal event for more than one great historical figure. And even today, abdominal pain continues to be the second most complained or related complaint for emergency service. Requests for EMS to respond or ED visits. It's the second most common complaint. So let's dive into some of the anatomy of the digestive system. The picture on the left is everyone has probably seen before. It's sort of a blown up version because really the one on the right is really more accurate the way it looks. The one on the right is a program I have and have been really trying to learn to use called the Bio Digital Human. So there really is basically the same parts on both sides of the screen there, the left and the right. Clearly the left is more of an animated drawing uh, depiction and on the right is, uh, is also, but it's a computer generated version basically. But the point being that the one on the left is kind of a blown out thing. You can see how their difference is on the, on the right and the left there. The liver is really sitting on top of the stomach and pancreas underneath all that. So it starts at the mouth and goes all the way to the rectum. So anything in between can be abdominal pain. And it usually, of course, generates or originates from the GI tract. The upper GI starting at the mouth with chewing and swallowing and going down the esophagus to the stomach. Uh, then the GI tract is responsible for nutrient extraction, for continuance of energy production with homeostasis. The lower GI tract starting at the small intestine, which is about 22 feet. Also in the abdominal section, the abdominal quadrants, the intestines. Starting up here at the top, just off of the stomach, is the duodenum, about a foot long. And that receives the semi-fluid partially digested stomach contents or chyme. Then the liver and pancreas secrete enzymes for further digestion. So we're starting here at the duodenum, and it, right in here is where what you don't really see in this particular picture because this is the intestines, but the liver and the stomach is where this is dumping into, and then the pancreas, and it, they're both secreting their um, juices, their enzymes to promote further digestion. Then it goes into the, the duodenum, which is this piece right here. This is about eight feet long. It's responsible for chemical digestion and absorption of nutrients. The large intestine, this bigger piece, uh, includes the cecum right here, uh, the colon. You have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and then the descending or descending colon. I should watch my pronunciation there, but. And then this sphygmoid, or pardon me, this sigmoid colon over here in the ileum. And all these, you can read that picture there. Another picture of essentially the same thing we've been discussing, the urinary system here. And this one's highlighting the kidneys. And this is a retroperitoneal view of the kidneys. Or really, I guess it's not technically. It's 
This is still the right kidney in this picture. I looked at that backwards. I apologize. This is just removing away the other slides previous to this that showed us what organs were lying in front of that. I looked at that incorrectly. My mistake. But the right kidney and, of course, the left kidney and then your vena cavas and all these large major vessels and stuff. And, of course, here you can clearly see the pelvis. So that should be my all this other muscle fiber and stuff that's been cut away in this picture or diagram here. The kidneys, uh, the ureters, and the urinary bladder are really what we're focused on here as far as the urinary system. Of course, it's responsible for the removal of waste, uh, mainly in the form of urine or in, in, in uric acid, regulation of electrolyte balance like sodium, potassium, and calcium. Also, a big factor, a big uh, piece of regulation of the acid-base balance controls blood volume and therefore by maintaining blood pressure. Consist of all those organs I already mentioned there. It's the bladder, the ureter, the kidneys. Uh, abdom I'm sorry, liver, stomach, and pancreas. Again, we've seen these in the other pictures a few slides ago, but of course the liver is actually under the rib cage. Stomach, and the liver has two parts. It has the main uh, upper right quadrant section uh, that are responsible for uh, regulation and metabolism and hematology. It has the head and the tail is what this, the head is this part here really on the right side. The tail is kind of center abdominal or somewhat over even to the left side. Uh, the liver very vascular and can weigh up to three pounds, the whole thing. Uh, the gall bladder uh, stores and, and uh, modifies bile. Bile is that dark green, uh, yellowish brown fluid produced by the liver, uh, aids in digestion of fats or lipids. And of course, the pancreas, which is hard to see. It's where it sits right in behind the stomach. So, gives you a good idea. Of course, the sternum, the xiphoid process, obviously ribs, you can see. So a different conversation could be about trauma and what uh, kind of injuries to be expected there. Abdominal quadrants, the one on the left here is probably the most common. Everyone's familiar with, with the four sections, the uh, two right and two lower on the left and right side. I'm sorry, two upper and two lower on the left and right side. The one here on the right side of your screen is uh, has divided a few more times, and it brings in some words that not everyone would be familiar with, with the uh, hypochondriac region, the right and the left, and then the lumbar and iliac regions. So you see how it's simply been divided uh, one more time to create, instead of four quadrants, actually creates nine. So the right hypochondriac region contains the liver, the gallbladder and small intestines, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, right kidney, and so on. You can see this. This is to most, mostly to better, more precisely locate, document, communicate where a injury or pain is. Uh, for our purposes, mostly the standard four-quadrant assessment uh, regions are fine. Structural contents of the abdominal uh, cavity, the hollow organs. Remember, there's, we have hollow and solid organs in the abdominal cavity. Uh, you can read those yourself. The major organs, the aorta, the vena cavas, appendix, bladder, common bile. You know all those organs that have been there. there. You learn that stuff in EMT class. Uh, solid organs are kidneys, liver, ovaries, pancreas, and spleen. Again, a very kind of elementary EMT class sort of thing you would have learned. Connective tissue. Uh, the peritoneum is a serous membrane lining of the ca lining cavity of the ab abdomen and covering the abdominal organs. These two are kind of important to remember here. The mesentery is a fold in the peritoneum that attaches Stomach, small intestine, pancreas, spleen, and other organs to the posterior wall of the abdomen. So those are your connective tissues inside the abdominal cavity. Structural, stru uh, skeletal structures, pardon me. The vertebral column and musculature. 
the diaphragm muscles of the abdominal wall. Those are skeletal structures inside the abdomen, abdomen or the abdominal cavity. Pain-producing mechanisms. These, most of these are not new terms to you. Distension, everyone knows what distension is. Traction, it says it right there. Tension or stretching, you can probably imagine that. Edema, which is bulleted there as vascular congestion. That is the enlargement of an entity such as uh, that would contain blood vessels. Um, and also, it is known to occur in deep vein thrombosis. So you can imagine uh, vascular congestion, like sinus congestion. It's a backup of vascular fluids. Either it's done as a mechanical process for it, or it's because maybe it's from a disease process. Inflammation, obstruction, ischemia, all things that we're familiar with, chemical irritation by uh, blood or a sepsis, uh, et cetera, issue. Areas of referred pain, um, this slide sort of speaks for itself, but to spend a moment here, we'll look at the uh, these descriptions where it's pointing up here to the shoulders, uh, somewhat anterior, up and down the neck a little. Diaphragmat diaphragmatic irritation from swollen or ruptured abdominal organs, tissues. So, I mean, this is close to an area of the classic chest pain presentation, but that's minus a few things, obviously, if that's where their pain only is. And right in the center of the chest is pneumonia, pleurisy, AMI. See how the AMI, of course, we know is uh, the neck pain uh, as well as the arm pain that they're usually together for AMI. Uh, so you might have some of this kind of pain and this, obviously. Appendicitis in the center or at the umbilical cord, umbilicus or belly button. Um, a little further down, things like uh, colon obstruction, diverticulitis, they're in the center of the umbilical cord. The kidney stones, of course, running down the ureter on either side. Back over here to this guy on the uh, right side, the cholecystitis, which is the gallbladder pain, which is right there behind that shoulder blade and possibly right in the center of the back or it could also be in the center by itself is considered possibly pancreatitis. So. This is a good slide to look at because when your, your patients are complaining to pain about you and they can pinpoint their kind of pain, this uh, could be handy to remember and it might help you uh, know what sort of organs are the problem here. Origins of abdominal pain, visceral, visceral, and then we have coming up next a different one called uh, parietal pain. Visceral occurs when the wall walls, pardon me, of the hollow organs are stretched, thereby activating stretch receptors, thereby causing pain. There's a deep, persistent, achy pain, crampy, burning, gnawing, even pain. So that's the type of pain that you would have if it's vis or I'm sorry, visceral pain. I'm, I'm right. Visceral pain. And then the next one is parietal pain arises from the parietal peritoneum. This is localized, intense. This is the pinpoint that they can point to the pain. Remember, so visceral would be more regeneralized pain. Parietal pain, they can point straight to it. Uh, associated uh, with the, the T6 through L1. And it tends to be on one side. And they usually describe it as sharp or constant. They prefer to be in the fetal position and provoked by parietal movement. So this sort of pain would probably not be a good one to try and assess with abdominal palpation and stuff. They're going to not like it too much. Origins of abdominal pain, referred pain, pain felt at a false site like intra-abdominal. This is kind of back to your chart from a couple of slides ago like gallbladder. Extra-abdominal pain, I discussed that a moment ago with AMI and that could be a cause, the cause could be the heart. Results from misinterpretation of sensory input by the brain. All the nerves in the abdominal cavity are vast and spread across and even across midline. So it's not a precise uh, pain signal going back to the brain. That's why abdominal pain can be quite difficult to diagnose. But extra abdominal causes 
of abdominal pain. Uh, reading that slide is uh, signs and symptoms with that indigestion, chest pain, possibly AMI, dyspnea with indigestion, also possibly AMI, productive cough, fever with diffuse abdominal pain. This is possibly pneumonia. These are the outside causes, extra abdominal. Vomiting with diffuse abdominal pain, maybe diabetes. Severe colicky pain, suggesting intestinal obstruction, like drug abuse. Attacks of uh, severe abdominal pain, maybe a sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is out there. We may not hear about it an awful lot, but just a quick moment about that. It's a severe hereditary form of anemia in which mutated form of hemoglobin uh, distorts the red blood cells into a crescent shape at low oxygen levels. It is most common amongst African-American population. So sickle cell disease is something we don't see every day, but it can cause abdominal pain. Chronic abdominal pain, uh, spinal or a central nervous system disease. Common extra abdominal pain also causes a pain. AMI, we already discussed all those. Um, I didn't spend much more time on that one. So your differential diagnosis. This is that list of possibilities, and you need to have this list in your mind. Some people write it down. Uh, but you need to have some idea what's going on so you can select the right treatment therapy here. Obviously, in the pre-hospital world, we may not have a lot of treatment for these patients, but there are some things you do have in your toolbox that you may not want to use. You may just need to be aware, try and find out kind of how serious this is, and then, of course, transport. So we'll get into this. This is using the nine quadrants here, the hippocampus. Uh, hypochondriac region. Some call it hypochondriac region. Um, <clears throat> this one, of course, is the uh, contains the liver and gallbladder up here in the upper right for the right hypochondriac. Steady dull pain, possibly with jaundice, especially of sclera. Dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, chills, fever, possible of clotting disorders. Gallbladder, the intermittent colicky pain results from obstruction of gallstone. This uh, one more thing in the history here that's not listed is if there's gallbladder issues, was there a previously uh, consumed fatty meal? Uh, because the gallbladder, when it's starting to dysfunction and it's producing and maintaining, containing the bile, which its purpose is to break down lipids, if it's not doing that and can't break down lipids, you're going to have a backup. So this portal system is then in here di uh, diagrammed because it's coming up into the next section here, the epigastric region. Um, you see the gallbladder. So this is liver, of course, here, this larger pinkish colored one. Here's gallbladder with a little cutaway section. Ves uh, vasculature, uh, bile ducts, soft tissue, um, and then their stomach, and then the sphincter of odi, which is a, a right off of the pancreas, uh, the pancreas and the pancreatic duct. So this is the duodenal bulb, so backtracking here to the stomach. So uh, it's eaten, chewed, uh, digested, startly in the stomach, then to the duodenum, then liver uh, secretes bile, and the pancreas secretes, so it secretes its, uh, its enzymes, uh, to digest uh, carbohydrates and sugars and, and all the other stuff, the fats and other nutrients to be uh, digested and absorbed. So that is right here in this next section. It is in the epigastric region, so right in here. If it's the stomach, that's the origin, and that's the organ. It's a steady burning sensation indicates gastritis. Peritoneal signs may present with perforation of stomach wall, emesis, and so forth. Pancreas, constant severe pain, possibly of sudden onset, which may appear to be peritoneal or boring through. Then we move over to the left, hypochondriac region. The spleen and pancreas here, steady dull pain, uh, which may cause 
pain is sharp, so this capsule effect uh, referred to left neck shoulder accompanied by hemorrhagic shock. Pancreas is a constant severe pain, possibly of sudden onset. Also that boring through the back in case of pancreatic. Now we have the umbilical and hypogastric regions. Uh, as pretty common sense would tell you, the intestinal pain over the umbilicus is usually intermittent, colicky, dull, vomiting, diarrhea. Could be severe uh, hypogastric aortic pain, pulsating, steady tearing pain, possibly with peritonitis and shock, and it may be profound. I feel like I'm reading these to you, and I guess I kind of am. Kidneys and ureters, in inf in infective, that doesn't seem right, infective pain, steady, dull, associated with dysuria, fever, possibly radiating to the back. This is not that uncommon, of course. Obstructive pain, like with a kidney stone, in the ureters is the intermittent colicky, possibly radiating to the groin, can be extreme and painful and may be very restless. Um, the right iliac region, the ascending colon and appendix, uh, the right ovary and fallopian tubes. The left iliac region, the descending colon, which could be a, a history, maybe you've learned history of diverticulitis and that's probably what it is then, if it's on that uh, left iliac region on the left lower side about the belt line. So, Or a left ovary and or fallopian tube involvement, which can be quite uh, serious if there's any uh, ruptures going on there, which could cause a lot of heat, uh, bleeding or hemorrhage. To assess abdominal pain, you're seeing size up, body position is everything. Pardon me, I missed a edit there. A fetal position generally uh, would be a parietal pain, supine, usually indicates a visceral pain, and patient up and walking unable to get comfortable is an obstructive pain more on the, your kidney stone variety. So remember, parietal pain is probably something uh, connective tissue of the peritoneum, and then the uh, supine pain, a visceral pain, is probably organ. Assessing abdominal pain continued. Peculiarities of abdominal complaints. Be wary of shock. Uh, the abdomen can conceal a profound volume of blood. And the organs, some are hollow, some are solid. The solid ones bleed. The hollow ones will simply leak their contents. So it's important to know the differences there. Again, more peculiarities of abdominal complaints. Disruptions of mentation caused by shock and lack of blood flow to the brain, perhaps. Emesis, uh, nature may indicate the source. So what kind of emesis, how much, when did it start, what's in it? Uh, tachypnea may relate to peritonitis and or shock. Uh, so there were some sort of uh, compensatory mechanism to uh, work with the, trying to resolve the uh, issues happening with shock there. Distension may point to ascites. Um, ascites refers to a, an abnormal accumulation of fluid in the abdominal or peritoneal cavity. <clears throat> Most common cause of ascites is cirrhosis of the liver. Treatment of ascites depends on its underlying cause. Always look at the skin there for uh, the major organ to see the uh, symptom there. Due to the complexity of the abdominal, uh, pardon me, of the abdomen, the focused history and physical exam are intended to identify a degree of life threat. Much like everything we do, it's recognition of what is truly life threatening. Our uh, limited ability to treat these things is, in fact, our Achilles' heel. But if we don't uh, recognize the life threatening abdominal pains, then we're not doing our patients any favors at all. Now we're going to get into some focus history, and this is going to be somewhat remedial, so we'll go through this fairly quickly. Your sample history in OPQRST mnemonics to understand the complaint. So we got some charts here to go down each of these. 
signs and symptoms, uh, moving over into OPQRST. And OPQRST, as most of you know, is really useful for pain questions. If you have pain and it's one of your signs and there were symptoms, um, not unuseful or totally worthless for things that aren't pain, but way more, more suited for pain questioning. So S for signs and symptoms. Now we've jumped over to the OPQRST, so we want to know what the onset was. Was it sudden or gradual? What were you doing? Has the same thing occurred before? P is the palliation provocation. What relieves the symptoms like antacids, positioning? What makes it worse? Q, quality. Describe it. Don't give them uh, simple one-word answers to answer this question or describe it. Ask them to tell you what it feels like. Don't give them yes or no possible answers here. That's the quality. The radiation, of course, where does it go? Does it hurt anywhere else? Obviously, severity. 1 to 10 scale or a 0 to 10. Hopefully, they have no pain at all, normally. So if they have zero pain, that would be understandable. And then a 10, of course, is how bad. And then time, when did the pain start and how long did it last if it's not going on now? All right, we'll get back over to uh, sample here in a second. But we're here here on this uh, other problems or complaints noted, like vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, weakness, rashes, or fevers. So focused physical exam, goal is to identify those life threats, like I said a moment ago, likely involvement of specific organs or processes. Best course of emergency care is to identify the life threats versus the non-life threatenings, the sick persons versus the not so sick ones, and transport them to the proper level of care, the proper appropriate hospital. Signs of acute status, a sudden onset, a severe pain, especially a knife-like pain, a cutting, a tearing pain, pul palpable, pulsating masses is not a good thing to hear your patient say. Any loss of consciousness, signs of shock, uh, the tilt test we'll get into here in a second. Uh, most would maybe refer to this as the orthostatic vital signs test or the, of course, the tilt test or some will know it by to measure vital signs with the patient supine, then sitting or standing, <clears throat> and repeat. A positive sign of shock would include a rapid change in skin color. Remember, skin color is an excellent vital sign. Complaint of dizziness or nausea, disappearance of radial pulse would be bad. Increase of pulse of 10 to 20 beats. Of course, increase in pulse means really an early sign of shock. So if they've still got a radial pulse, fantastic, but did it jump? 10 to 20 beats per minute, indicating that there is something significant going on there, or, of course, a drop in blood pressure. So a drop in blood pressure and the disappearance of radial pulse might be uh, coinciding symptoms or signs. Important to note, abdominal pain is a common finding in cardiac emergencies, diabetics, like diabetic ketoacidosis, DKAs, and ectopic pregnancies. So to rule out or in abdominal pain and or some of these other ones is to, of course, check your EKG, a monitor. 12 lead would not be un unnecessary. It would be a good idea for a 12 lead. Of course, blood sugar, <clears throat> getting into uh, reproductive sexual uh, histories there to see if there's a chance of a pregnancy that has uh, not made it to the uterus and has, in fact, uh, ruptured in the fallopian tubes and caused a significant injury to the fallopians or an ectopic pregnancy that could bleed a lot. Treatment for these is going to be your position of comfort, uh, high flow O2 for shock, we'll follow our oxygen guideline there, maintaining something 94% or better. Crystalloid IVs <coughs> and do this in route. Uh, that slide still says consider the anti-shock trousers. Um, I probably should have taken that off of there and consider dopamine. Of course, today we would probably consider Levofed as in place of dopamine. In summary here, three mechanisms resulting in abdominal pain, mechanical, inflammatory, and ischemic. And then the types of pain we discussed were visceral, parietal, and referred. 
And if there's any questions, feel free to email me. Our uh, <clears throat> assessment is based on determining the immediate life threats, any potential life threats, or absolutely zero life threats at all. Uh, observation, physical exam, history, uh, your normal, normal approach to patient care, especially during transport. And this came from AMLS, Advanced Medical Life Support Editions uh, 3 and 4 over the last, uh, last 10 years or so. Thank you.